founded Torch Coffee Company, one of our purposes for Bean was we want to improve the lives of coffee farmers. So at the beginning of 2015, we asked ourselves, what is the one most important thing we can do? And we decided it was processing. We decided that with the coffee farmers we were working on, the number one thing that they could improve, that could improve their quality, that could improve the price they were getting for the coffee was coffee processing. So we uh, work with Coffee Quality Institute and Mario Fernandez and did some processing classes and we come up with a processing flavor matrix out of that work and today I wanted to present that flavor matrix to you and help you understand what this flavor matrix is communicating and how it might be used. So to really understand that we're going to first talk about just the basics of coffee processing. The main purpose of coffee processing is actually incredibly simple. Why do we process coffee? We process coffee because coffee is grown on a tree and the coffee bean which we want is inside of a fruit. And very simply put, we need to get that coffee bean out of the fruit and get it dried so that we can roast it and drink it. So there's lots of different processing methods and those different processing methods can end up with different coffee flavors. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about these different uh, coffee processes, but before I do that, I want to quickly do a review of the anatomy of a coffee cherry. This here is a sketch up of a coffee cherry. We have a skin on the outside. We have the pulp or the fruity part of the cherry. And then we have the mucilage. Uh, this mucilage is sometimes called the pectin layer. It's made mainly of pectin. And then we have this hard kind of shell um, that's called parchment. And inside the parchment, there's a thin layer called silver skin. And inside that is the bean, which we want, which is also the seed. And here is the processing flavor matrix, which we developed. Um, and I want to talk with you about how we developed it, how you can use it, what it's communicating. We start out with the cherry, and then outside of that cherry is five different processing methods, which you can choose as a producer how you want to process your coffee. And based on those processing choices, you get different flavors. In general, these five processing methods also have sub-processing. For example, a natural process has a standard natural, a whiny natural, and also a yeast fermented natural. And so let's take a look in more detail at these different processing methods. Let's start out with natural processing. With natural processing, this is the oldest form of processing coffee. Um, it's very simple. You simply pick ripe cherries, and with all of these processing methods, the most important thing is you start out with um, all completely fully ripe cherries. With natural process, once you pick those cherries, you dry them with all of the fruit on the cherry. And once it's dried to about 12%, you hull it and sort it, and then it's ready for roasting. Now let's look at washed. Wash processing isn't the most simplest, but it's the most widely used. Um, for wash processing, it's a little different. First, we're gonna siphon the coffee to get any floaters off the top. Then we depulp the coffee. Then it's gonna be fermented and washed and classified in a cl classifying channel. And then it's gonna be dried to 12% moisture content and hold and sorted. Because this wash process is dried with the pulp taken off, it's going to have much less of that pulpy, fruity flavors. Um, and then let's look at honey. Honey's kind of in the middle between the two. With the honey process, we also siphon, we also depulp it, but then we dry right then, and we still have all the mucilage on, so we're drying with the mucilage on. And the differences in processing will create vastly different flavors. 
but in general, the honey processed flavor is kind of going to be a mix between the washed and the natural. And that's why we have it physically located in between the natural and the wasp process on the processing flavor matrix. So let's look now in more detail at the sub-processing methods. So once you decide, hey, I want to do natural processes, I want to do, I want to have some fruity flavors, you really have three choices. You have the standard natural process. And when we did that, we got apricot strawberry and blueberry. Uh, we got more of these kind of fresh, berry-like flavors. And you'll notice the apricot is slightly bigger in size than the strawberry and blueberry. And that's because apricot was the primary flavor note, strawberry and blueberry were secondary flavor notes. So if the intensity was lesser, the size of the circle was smaller. Then you have a whiny process. And by whiny, what we mean is, is that after harvesting all ripe cherries, rather than directly drying, we delay the drying process and we allow some fermentation to happen um, by delaying the drying. We, we store the cherries in airtight bags for somewhere between 12 hours to 18 hours, depending on how much fermentation you want, and then we dry them. And with this, we got more blackberry, plum, grapefruit. The last natural process option we'll look at is yeast fermented. This is extremely unique processing method that is not widely used, but we experimented some with, and it was incredible the results we got. Basically, you harvest the, the cherries, you dry them in the fruit, but when the cherries are about half dry, you stop the drying process by rebagging them in airtight bags and you allow them to yeast ferment. With these coffees, we got amazing flavor characteristics like apple, red wine, and ferment. A lot of people really love these yeast fermented naturals. Now let's look at honey process. With the honey process coffee, you really have also three options. You have your yellow honeys, your red honeys, or your black honeys. And, and these colors relate to a couple different things. Um, partly is drying time, primarily is drying time. And this drying time relates to fermentation. The longer you take to dry coffee, the more fermentation that can happen. It also has somewhat to do with sugar content. If you don't have enough sugar content, you're not gonna get enough fermentation and you're never gonna get your black honeys. So with a yellow honey dried fairly fast, red honey dried slower, black honey dried even slower. Let's look lastly now at the washed. With washed you have two choices. Do I want to delay the fermentation uh, or delay the processing and have whiny fermentation or do I want to process the coffee when the cherries are still fresh. Your second choice is do you want to do dry ferment or wet ferment? And the combination of these two choices will give you four different options. A standard wet ferment, a standard dry ferment, a whiny dry ferment, and a whiny wet ferment. Typically what we found is these washed coffees had more sugar browning flavors, uh, more nutty flavors, but also some fruit. So we got much more fruit and nut mixed together. For example, we have the whiny dry ferment had more fruit, where the whiny wet ferment had more nutty and barley kind of sugar brownie flavors. The standard dry had kind of a mix of sugar browning and fruity flavors, uh, butter, toast, stone fruit. And the Standard wet ferment had more walnuts, lemon, and some spiciness in there with pepper. So these down here are your three standard processing methods. But there's, there's kind of some oddballs that don't really fit into any of these. Those are your mechanically demucilized coffees and your wet hold coffees. Your wet hold coffees typically are done on the island of Sumatra in Indonesia. And these coffees are going to have more uh, herbally 
earth-like, straw-like, woody type flavors. We essentially take all the protective covering off the bean, including the parchment, the silver skin, and we actually break the bean open a little bit. You'll see this, <laughs> we, we made the a stamp for this processing, a bean that's kind of broken open into a little goat's foot on the end, because that's what the beans look like. And now the, with no protective covering, broke open, the bean is then laid back on the patio to dry, and it's exposed to all kinds of microorganisms, yeast, molds, bacteria. Lastly, let's talk about the mechanically demucilized coffee. Basically with this coffee, there's little fermentation or no fermentation. We depulp it and then we use a machine and pressure to force the mucilage off. And, and with that pressure, we can kill the embryo. We can end up with some woody or cedar flavors, black tea, cloves. So the question is, okay, now you understand it. How are you gonna use this? Every different farm could potentially have a different processing method that creates the best coffee for that farm. For example, we did a processing uh, workshop in Puar, China, and we found that the natural process by far was the best process for that region. We then did the same workshop in Thailand and we found that the honeys were the best processing for that region. And actually, uh, Mario Fernandez has done some great research on this in Mexico. And they have some good ideas about which processing method may be best for which kind of area. It's going to depend a lot on what variety you have, what altitude you have, how good the soil quality. And um, another thing we need to be clear about is that all of those things will affect these flavors as much as the processing method will. So the processing method is not the only variable that affects these flavors. It's not as simple as just saying, well, which one's gonna get the best flavor? You really have to look at what resources does your farm have? Um, what's the weather there at your farm? What's the temperature? Because certain climates are more suited for doing natural processed coffee. When you dry a coffee with the fruit still on, it takes a lot more time. And if you're in a cold, wet climate, you're not gonna make naturals very easily. Um, if you're in an extremely hot climate, the naturals can dry too quickly and you may need shade. But depending on your altitude, your varieties, and your weather pattern, you may need to select which processing method if you have a farm and you're wondering, well, what processing me method should I do? Um, the only answer is it depends. You have to do the research. You have to try each of these different processes and control as many of the variables as you can to determine which processing method is best for you. This processing matrix that we're looking at here was specifically done for poor China based on our workshop there. If we go to other countries, do other workshops, we'll have different processing flavor matrix that describe the flavor attributes of the different processes in different areas. And they'll be completely different. Now, will there be trends? Definitely. We've already seen some trends and that naturals are gonna have more fruity flavors. Honeys may have more floral and uh, wash may have more nutty, but the actual flavor attributes could, be, could vary quite a lot. Again, the reason we did this matrix is we believe that coffee processing is the single greatest opportunity that we have to increase quality in the very short term. If you want to change varieties, it takes five to ten years. If you want to do a lot of the other work to improve quality, it takes uh, tons of time. But you can pr change your processing method um, with a little bit of training. In a couple weeks, you can implement new processing methods they can drastically improve quality and get a better price for the coffee. And so this is just the beginning. Um, we, we believe that in the next five years there's going to be more and more emphasis on the processing methods used in coffee and we're going to see uh, probably new developments. Probably there's going to be new, new logos on here that aren't here now, more stamps and different processing methods that haven't even been developed yet in the next five years.